rifle balance, handgun point shooting, and the Olight PL2RL, this week on Mail Call Mondays. Mail Call Mondays is brought to you by Modular Driven Technologies. If you need a chassis system for your precision rifle, check out mdttac.com. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Welcome to another Mail Call Mondays, and this Monday our questions come from Patreon. If you guys want to know more about Patreon and how to support the content that you know and love, check out the link down below. And our first question comes from Winners, and Winners asks, Hi John. Where would you consider would be a good spot for your rifle to balance? In front of the magwell? Practicing shooting off a barricade, still have lots of up and down moves. Tips on eliminating them. Well, winners, my preference for balance is directly in front of the magwell, right about here so you are as close as possible to that front scope mounting point and as close as possible to the actual receiver of the rifle. Obviously, you can't get past the magazine, if your rifle balances somewhere back in here, uh, that's no good because you can't really rest this portion of the rifle on a barricade and get good function. Uh, a lot of rifles, if you have upward pressure on the magazine well or even rearward pressure on the magazine well, it can cause malfunctions. Uh, so I like to have it right underneath here. In addition, if you run into a stage where you have to sling up and shoot supported without uh, any I'm sorry, unsupported, uh, without any forward support on the rifle. Uh, generally, this is where your hand ends up for the most stable position when you're creating that bridge between the side of your body and the rifle. And so if you have a chassis system like the ESS chassis here that actually has a uh, hand stop or a hand support right here, uh, the Accuracy International AX chassis have the same thing, uh, that is a really good place for the rifle to balance out. Now, balancing the rifle is very often a tricky situation because you have to kind of do this guessing thing to figure out uh, how much your receiver weighs, how much your scope is going to weigh out, how much the buttstock that you're choosing, if it's an adjustable buttstock type situation, and then uh, how long to make your barrel and what barrel profile to use. Uh, now, I generally go with a Sendero Varmint, maybe a little bit heavier style barrel, so I don't have a ton of weight out front and I can run a longer barrel without really having all that dangling out there. Uh, but you really run into this tricky situation and until you've uh, set up a rifle and shot with a certain setup for a while, it's difficult to guess where that balance point is going to be. And uh, we are sponsored by Modular Driven Technologies, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, but MDT has released a really cool chassis that we should have in our hands uh, very shortly called the ACC, and that is the Adjustable Core Competition Chassis. Uh, there are quite a few other manufacturers out there that are starting to do this as well with their chassis systems, uh, but the ACC accommodates different weights in the front and in the buttstock of the rifle uh, to be able to really balance that system out. And to go with something like the ACC, uh, you're not paying very much more than you would uh, with a standard chassis, for instance, like the ESS we have here, or an MPA or a AX chassis, those kind of things. Uh, so looking for a chassis system where you can actually adjust where those weights are now gives you the freedom to choose whatever barrel profile, whatever barrel length that you want, uh, whatever scope that you want. And then if you change something later on, you add a suppressor, uh, you decide you want to go with a shorter barrel, then you can move weights around uh, to get the adjustment exactly where you want it to be. Uh, with systems like the ACC, where it incorporates external weights as well, uh, you also have the option to be able to change weights on the fly if you want. So it's kind of a really cool setup overall. Uh, we did shoot a really quick video. It was a range tips uh, chair barricade video, about a two minute long video. We'll link to it down below uh, so you guys can check that out. And we were shooting the prototype ACC chassis in that video. And you can see with a 20 inch barrel and a suppressor on it, we had it balancing perfectly on a Reezer Precision Game Changer bag right in the middle. Uh, that brings up one additional thing on the whole uh, balance situation. If you've got a really flat barricade, like a standard uh, 2x4 skills barricade, uh, then it kind of makes it easy to rest the rifle on it and then brace it over that front scope mounting point and uh, settle the rifle down. 
But if either the surface that you're setting the rifle on is slanted one way or the other, or if it's very narrow, uh, then you can run into a lot of problems getting that perfect balance. The more narrow you make that fulcrum, uh, the easier it is for the rifle to teeter-totter back and forth. Uh, so if you run in a situation like that, a uh, game changer bag, like the, the Razor Precision Game Changer, uh, really makes a big difference in the stability of the rifle when you're shooting off a of barricades. I know there are a lot of guys out there that don't like to add a ton of gear to their setup. Uh, they want to work more on skill. Uh, but really, this is one of the positions or one of the items that really makes a huge difference in competition, being able to throw that bag down, have a nice, soft, malleable surface uh, that you can adjust the angle of the rifle and get it stuck down in there and just really settle down and get a nice, steady sight picture. It really makes all the difference in the world. And we'll leave links to that stuff down below through the link to all links. Uh, so make sure you click the link to all links down below and we'll leave links to everything that we talk about. Our next question comes from Mark, and Mark asks, You occasionally do pistol-related stuff, which I also find interesting. I train frequently from a carry perspective. Do you endorse the point-and-shoot method for close quarters, I'm thinking 3 to 10 yards, or do you always use your sights? Also, you've covered the Guardian series before, which I really enjoyed. One of them was from Frontline Defense in North Carolina. Watching that inspired me to take their intro to long-range shooting course, Great guys, great facility, and now I'm hooked and want to move forward with PRS. So thank you for introducing me to the sport. Well, Mark, you're welcome. I am glad that we got you hooked into it. Uh, your pocketbook may not be glad, but uh, it's a really great sport. And the guys down at Frontline Defense are a great crew. It's a great facility to uh, shoot at. So I'm glad you got to go down there and take a class from them. Now, on your question about point shooting, um, there are a lot of arguments for point shooting. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence about officers that are involved in shootings that uh, didn't see their sights or um, less trained individuals that were involved in shooting and didn't see their sights. And then uh, there are a lot of instructors out there that advocate uh, ignoring the sighting system, just pointing the gun out and target fixating and engaging. Um, I am somewhere in between the point shooting camp and the you must always use your sights camp because uh, the reality is our body has certain mechanisms inside that affect uh, how we are able to use the tools at our disposal. Uh, one of the issues is that when you're confronted with a lethal threat, your body has a tendency to threat fixate. Uh, you will focus on the threat, you will concentrate on the threat, and it is very difficult to break that plane of focus and bring it back to the front sight, which is the most critical point of aim on your handgun. Uh, so the closer the threat is, the more difficult it is to break that fixation on the target and concentrate on the sights. Uh, and that's why as distances are more compressed, uh, you will see more instances of people saying they couldn't see the sights or they didn't see the sights. And very often, if you go back and you look at surveillance video or body camera video, uh, they haven't even brought the handgun to full presentation, meaning up to the line of sight, before they engage the target. Very often, they are looking over the sights and have only brought the handgun up to about center portion uh, before they fire. So um, my view on it is that Train to use your sights, and if a target is so close that you are almost contact range, then the necessity to use your sights is not there. You drive the handgun out until it's silhouetted on the target, and you fire. Uh, blocky handguns, like semi-automatic handguns, like the Glock that I have here, when you punch the slide out, it's very easy to see the sides of the slide in the peripheral vision when you're looking over the target. So it's fairly simple to see if the slide is lined up on the target as a course aiming aid. Additionally, if you actually train in presenting the handgun time and time again, then you should have your natural point of aim as soon as the rifle or as soon as the handgun comes up. As soon as you push it up, you should be getting that natural point of aim. And so if you have to fire before you have full presentation, uh, then you are going to be fairly well lined up with the target. Now, as those engagement distances increase, as the target gets further away, uh, then it becomes more critical to focus on that front sight and make sure that you see the front sight on the target. Seeing the front sight on the target will make sure that the muzzle isn't depressed, uh, which will also send shots low and it will exaggerate the tendency to jerk the trigger and send shots low. Uh, so you want to see that front sight on the target.
Uh, as distances increase beyond that, then the rear sight comes into play and in making sure that you have the front sight clearly lined up in the blurry rear notch of the rear sight against a blurry target is more critical to get accurate hits at longer ranges. Uh, so there is a lot of things going on, and that's one of the reasons I am starting to advocate more for dot sights on handguns, even defensive concealed carry handguns, uh, because it works with the body's natural instinct to target fixate. So now you can still target fixate, you can drive the weapon up to eye level, and you'll have a dot appear on the target, assuming that you've done your dry fire work and your presentation work, and you get a good grip on the handgun as it comes out of the holster. Uh, now you can target fixate. You can work with that body's natural instinct to focus on the threat that's trying to kill you and still have a very precise, very visible aiming point. So that's why I really like red dot sights and that's why I advocate for seeing what you need to see. If you are up close, down and dirty, contact range fighting, uh, you don't really need to see your front sight. You don't need to see your sights at all. I can knock the sights off of this Glock and I could still get accurate center mass hits at contact range and slightly beyond. Uh, when we start to get to across the room and further distances, uh, we need that front sight. And then when we get outdoors to longer ranges, uh, we need both sights, front and rear. Uh, so train to different distances. If you go out to the range and you set up your own drills, uh, it may be a good idea to set up a contact range target, an intermediate target, and a longer range target, and then transition between the different sight pictures. And that will just get programmed into your brain that see what you need to see, engage what you need to engage. If you are starting to miss further out, make sure that you are slowing down and you are getting that sight picture. A slow hit counts a whole lot more than a fast miss. So keep that in mind. Hopefully that'll give you some things to work on uh, when you go out shooting and hopefully that answers your question. Now that's it for the two questions that we have. I did want to talk a little bit about this guy that I've got mounted to the handgun right here. Uh, this is an Olight PL2 RL. The RL stands for red laser. This is a 1200 lumen weapon light with a red laser on the bottom. Uh, Olight sent this out to me uh, last week. They are doing a flash sale that is actually today a one day only sale where they'll give you 35% off of this light. Just click the little link down below. So um, the problem that I have with some of these is they send the stuff out to me quick enough that it doesn't really give me a time to do a full in-depth review, but we did do a pretty quick abbreviated review with it. I put some rounds uh, down range with the uh, Glock 45 with this guy attached to it. Problem being, of course, I don't have any holsters that this will fit in uh, because the laser does protrude quite a bit off the bottom here. And what we found so far on this is at the price point that this light comes in at, I think it's a fairly good deal if you want a white light uh, with a red laser. Now, if you don't need the red laser, they do have the PL2 Valkyrie version of this, uh, which is still the 1200 lumen weapon light, but it does not have the laser on the bottom and it will fit in a wider variety of holsters that are out there. Uh, we're working on getting one of those in to do a full review on it because I think it is actually a more interesting setup. Uh, now, I did take the light out and do some work with it and I found that the 1200 lumens claim is uh, pretty close. I don't have any way to objectively evaluate that, but I took out the new 1000 lumen Surefire X300 Ultra and uh, shined them across the uh, backyard at a utility box uh, back in the back corner of the yard. And uh, the brightness seems to be pretty close between the two. Uh, this has a more white to bluish white, a little bit cooler beam, uh, whereas the Surefire has more of a greenish tint to their beam, and that is intentional. They, they believe that it uh, helps with color reproduction and uh, target identification. I won't argue that point, but it is a difference between the two colors, and a clear white beam tends to appear brighter uh, than a warmer or a greenish tint beam. But they were fairly close uh, to my eye, just again, shining them across the backyard. Uh, the beam pattern is close, but the Surefire has a little bit more gradual drop-off and a little bit smoother beam pattern, uh, whereas the beam pattern on the Olight has a really good hot center to it. And then it still has a decent amount of throw off to the side, but you can really see the step-off. 
Um, I didn't get a chance to uh, shoot pictures against a white plain background that much better shows the tapering off of the beam pattern, uh, but it's pretty clear when you take it out and use it that the Olight has a really distinct hot spot. Uh, some guys like that. Some guys feel that that uh, helps you with a longer throw on the beam, a greater distance that the beam will go to. Uh, some guys prefer it because they will use it as a close-in aiming aid uh, versus... Um, longer range type deals or versus a smoother flood type beam. Um, now the laser, we did have problems with the laser uh, being visible in daylight. Uh, in broad daylight, 12 noon, or even this morning when I was out shooting drills with it, um, I could not see it on a uh, 20 yard target. Now closer in target, broad daylight, three to five yards, uh, you can definitely see the red laser, but anything greater than that, you can no longer see the laser. Uh, and this is significantly problematic because with these lasers, I tend to advise that if you're going to use a red laser on your pistol, uh, you wanna zero it as far out as you possibly can. I really prefer to zero them about that 50 yard mark uh, because then the extreme height difference between your iron sights and the laser uh, has less of effect at greater distances. So let's say you take this guy and you uh, zero it at five yards so that the laser is actually right on your point of impact. Uh, well, as you go out, now that beam is gonna diverge from the point of impact very severely because you have a really sharp angle into that close range target. And then that angle is gonna diverge very sharply as you go out to greater distances to the point where if you're across the room and you put the laser on their head, uh, you may be hitting belt to knees somewhere in that area. So, uh, you want to make sure that you zero further out, at least get out to 25 yards or so when you're zeroing that laser. And that will really help you uh, with your point of aim, because from that distance in, uh, the greatest distance on this platform you'll have is 2.5 inches between the laser emitter and the iron sights. So your shot is going to be, I'm sorry, between the uh, laser emitter and the axis of the bore, uh, your shot is going to be no more than 2.5 inches off. So just something to think about when you zero these guys. Uh, now, a couple of the good things about it is it is water resistant to IPX rating. So um, if you splash it, throw it in the puddle, you know, it gets uh, poured on, it's going to be good to go. It uses two CR123 batteries. Uh, it has a really nice uh, tap on, tap off, or momentary uh, activation on the pads on either side. So it is ambidextrous. You can run it with laser laser and light or light only with the selector switch on the bottom, much like the Surefire X400. Uh, finally, the mount on it uh, is a really neat system. We just have a throw lever here, but when you flip the throw lever forward, uh, the mount will not immediately fall off the handgun. You have to push the lever in uh, to remove the light. Uh, this also means that if you're running this guy uh, in a pocket, in a pouch, something on a duty belt, and you need to put it on your gun, uh, it does go on very quickly. Uh, so you can pull it out of a pocket, snap it on, use it, and then when you're ready to holster up, pop it back off, holster up, and be done. Uh, back in the day before we could run holsters that accepted weapon lights, I did that quite a bit. And having a very quick and easy mounting system uh, that you can intuitively snap on is very important. Now it is, uh, it does have two different lugs in it for Glock or for Universal. Uh, so you can swap back and forth between the two. And um, it, the mounting system is fairly secure, but one thing that we did notice is it will slip forward and back a little bit. So when you put it on, you do need to make sure that you preload it forward uh, when you snap it down. And that way recoil will not push it um, out of battery or slide it around on the light rail and cause you any issues. So that is our overall quick view of the Olight PL2RL. Uh, if you don't need the laser, I would highly suggest you save a few bucks and go with the PL2. Uh, but if you are not into Surefire money, which I greatly prefer the Surefire or the Streamlight lights, uh, if you don't have that kind of budget and you are just looking for a good nightstand light uh, that will be used fairly infrequently, then definitely take a look at the Olight PL2 or the PL2 RL. And again, we'll leave a link down below to that. Flash sale going on today so you can save 35 
percent if you really want to pick one up. That's it for this Mail Call Mondays. If you guys have any questions or comments over anything we've covered, leave it in the comments section down below or send it to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you're listening to us on your favorite podcast app, you can send questions to us at 8541tactical at gmail.com. If you like the video, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe, and make sure you hit that little bell icon so you get notified when we release new content. And until next time, get out and shoot!